I was saying the webinar is already uploaded on our website. So if you go to nirex.net slash webinars, you will see the part one hyperscanning video here, among other webinars that we have previously conducted and recording. So there's also a hyperscanning specific webinar somewhere down if you're curious about how FNIR's hyperscanning is done with Marix devices. Okay. I also want to welcome back Dr. Pascal Ritika, who introduced us last week uh, to the fundamentals of hyperscanning and some key considerations of FNIR specific hyperscanning. And today we'll talk a bit more um, about data analysis aspects of when you do FNIR's hyperscanning. If you're joining us for the first time, uh, we are Nirex. We have been passionate about developing and supporting cutting edge FNIR's technologies for over 20 years now. And if you're curious about the latest and greatest with Nirex, do get in touch with us or subscribe to our newsletter. Um, to keep things flowing, we you will be muted, but of course, uh, questions are welcome. Please type your questions in the chat during the talk or feel free to unmute yourself and ask directly during the Q&A at the end of the webinar. Um, my name is Mahipal and as always, I'm very thankful to my colleague, Kami, for organizing and making these events happen. Same goes to our marketing team. And once again, Thankful to Dr. Pascal Viteka for his time to do these amazing talks. Um, Dr. Viteka is a social neuroscientist and associate professor at University of Essex. His lab is doing some amazing work on social neuroscience and currently focuses on biobehavioral and interpersonal neural synchrony. So do look at his webpage. It's pretty amazing, actually. I have it open here. Um, if you're starting with FNES, I would highly recommend you to, to go and take a look at all these topics, starting from what is half, what is FNES hyperscanning to all the way to analysis. So highly recommended that you visit that. All right, without further ado, I would like to hand over the virtual mic to Pascal and the stage is yours. Thank you very much for uh, the nice introduction. I will now um, share my screen and set everything up on my end. Just give me a little while. Okay. Um, yeah, so welcome to the second part of uh, the webinar covering um, the more practical applications of um, FNIR's hyperscanning. Um, but before uh, delving into the content, I would like to invite you to um, one more time, like last time, quickly share a few things with me um, and especially uh, where you are coming from. So if you go, um, if you see up here on the left, there is a link. It should also be in the chat. It's a poll everywhere com, um, poll where you should uh, see this on your computer or your cell phone or your laptop or anywhere. And you should be able to click where you are right now at the moment. Uh, so for us to see a little bit as well, who is actually joining us and from where, which uh, yeah, is always nice to um, give us a little feeling of whom we are talking to, even though uh, right now I'm just seeing my screen and nothing else. And I see that we have, um, yeah, as last time, quite some people attending from all over Europe. And then there is also quite a, a big blurb uh, on the east side of the US and Canada. So we are quite an international group today, which is really nice to see. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for participating. Now we have the second technical thing that my mouse has disappeared, but I will try to just uh, advance. So thank you very much for participating. There will be now two more um, participation 
uh, opportunities. So the first one uh, would be to ask uh, what you actually your current occupation is. So whether you are a student or whether you are um, a postdoc, PhD, whether you are uh, at the professor level or whether you are maybe even joining us from somewhere outside of academia and um, trying to use this method for non-academic purposes, which of course is also very interesting and relevant. And I can see that we have uh, about mm -hmm. a bit more than half. Um, yeah, a little bit more than half from academia and the other 40% from non-academic backgrounds, which is uh, also always very interesting to, to know. Thank you for that. And finally, um, just for, for us to gauge a little bit again, how much experience you actually have with FNIRS hyperscanning. Um, so hopefully um, the content that will be provided today will be helpful for as many of you as possible, even though you might have quite different levels already uh, in your experience of using FNIRS hyperscanning actually. But I can see that the distribution again is quite uh, quite nice. So there are people who have not used it before and there are some people who have used it for quite a while. So hopefully the things I'll be talking about today will be relevant for as many of you as possible. So thank you very much for that. Uh, let's now try to move on and my mouse is back which is cool so i can uh, make this go away so um the last time we talked about um more theoretical considerations experimental design um yeah what you what you need to consider when you set up an experiment and today we will be focusing more on practical considerations for uh, data analysis so data acquisition data pre-processing and data analysis um finally um right um so as i said just before we will first look a little bit at some uh, some things related to data collection then when you got the data what you have to do to pre-process it uh, in a most consistent way also making sure that the findings are as uh, replicable as um, possible um, and then uh, looking at uh, data analysis some details on that um yeah, Mahipal has already introduced my website where all of this is summarized. So uh, if you want to have a look also to find the recording and have some other resources, you know, to all the papers that I'm going to show today where I can't go into too many details. So please have a look there. You find all the links and the relevant um, resources there as well. Um, so let's start with data collection and maybe just generally speaking, uh, also to say, of course, that FNIRS hyperscanning um, relies on FNIRS, and therefore, when we talk about hyperscanning, we have to consider certain things that are also relevant if you are using FNIRS just in single participants. So there is quite some overlap, but I'll always try to emphasize um, what is uh, more important for hyperscanning and maybe what is even specific to hyperscanning. Also, uh, the webinar today is going to show some technical details, but it is not meant to really, you know, go into very fine details of uh, how to set up your lab and how to um, program everything. So if you have questions on that, um, I'm sure the NRX team is always very happy to assist. There are also very nice resources already available on their website. So this is more to stimulate some general thinking about certain issues that should be kept in mind. If you have more specific questions, maybe you can ask them in the Q&A at the end, or as I said, NRX will certainly be very um, um, yeah, keen to help you with, with that as well. So, uh, all right, so you are thinking of collecting uh, data, and I think that uh, this question might sound a little, little bit trivial, but I think it is really important to ask. So if you are thinking about a hyperscanning study. Why do you think you should be actually using FNIRS? So why not use um, something else, an other method? You know, there is EEG, there is MEG, there is fMRI. So why do you think it should? It's particularly beneficial to use um, FNIRS hyperscanning. Um, what are the advantages and the disadvantages? So you should be seeing this on the screen. 
and uh, you should also just be able to um, type in your response. And once you did so, we should be able to see it. Oh yeah, okay. First stuff already coming in. Thanks a lot, brilliant. So um, we have faster setup, higher mobility, portable, can handle some motion, especially for kids. Yes, naturalistic, real social interaction situations, good temporal resolution, uh, ec ecologically valid experiments within co without constraints. Um, yes, the relations happen with movement, e.g. does not bode well with that. Uh, again, motion artifacts, um, realistic in environment, um, that there are more physical limitations with other techniques, natural inter uh, interactions, yes. So everything goes um, more into the direction of, you know, we can f use it more freely, <laughs> Too many people are doing AEG, yes, to do something new. A large groups, yes. So it's you can also sync up uh, five, six, ten more people. So yeah, so all of these things are very important to consider. So thank you very much for for that. And so we will go a little bit into this um, right now if I can if I can keep this going. Yes. So why should we use or why why can we use FNIRS for doing hyperscanning? And you mentioned most of these advantages already, right? So we have a good spatial resolution. We also have a not too bad temporal resolution, right? So um, you, these days we can sample with 50 Hertz or, or even more, even though we should probably down sample that this then for, for analysis. We are less prone to movement artifacts, uh, which allows for naturalistic paradigms, especially if we have the newest portable devices, right, where we can uh, participants can actually freely move around the room. And it's quite efficient in testing, right? There's no gel or hair washing needed. Uh, you can quite easily put it on and, and take it off. So it's also quite fast and, and um, quite comfortable for the participants to be uh, wearing. Um, there are some constraints, maybe not as advantages, but constraints, right? So we can only look at cortical areas that are about two to three centimeters below the skull. So we cannot look at deeper brain regions. And we are not able to look at very fast neural processes. Um, we have a latency of, of a couple seconds because our data depends on the bold signal, right? So if you if you take these into uh, considerations, uh, these things into consideration, then you can decide actually whether um, using FNIRS is the best for your study or whether you should probably um, look for some other methods. Um, this brings me to spatial resolution. So um, yeah, usually we have. Um, about 20 to 30 channels, but you can these days also um, ramp it up quite considerably to 50, 60 channels. Um, we have to consider that um, we have to always ensure the channels are about three centimeters apart. For children and infants, this is a little bit less. And that, of course, uh, means that we have to carefully decide on our montage, on our template, on our optode arrangement, where and how we put the optodes, because not all arrangements that we might think about are actually really possible practically when we look at how these different optodes um, and the, the sources and the detectors need to be arranged. So here is just a very schematic representation of some of our uh, design where we usually have four ROIs and each ROI has uh, four channels. Um, so the first thing you have to ask yourself, okay, is it actually really useful? Um, can we uh, measure from the regions that we are interested in? And we can measure really well from many cortical regions, you know, including the prefrontal cortex, the temporal parietal cortex, uh, motor areas, sensory motor, sensory areas, visual areas, areas related to speech, to attention, to decision making, to mentalizing. So we can re reach quite a few areas, but some, of course, we can't, right? Like the deeper emotion areas, uh, insula, amygdala, or, or, or hippocampus related to memory. So this is something we need to take into consideration. Now, what we also need to uh, think about very carefully is whether we choose a pre-made opto template that is provided by the manufacturer, like uh, NRX or other manufacturers or whether we use uh, templates that we actually come up with by ourselves. And the main constraint really here is that 
this has to be implementable in terms of the array, right? We always have to have a source and a detector to create a channel, and these sources and detectors have to be in a certain geometrical arrangement with one another. So here you have um, a standard layout uh, in 10, five positions for 16 sources, 16 detectors to measure um, uh, motor activity. And, and so uh, you can check your manufacturer's um, software and there you will find some pre-made templates and maybe it's easier for you if you have never used FNIRS before to stick with some of those templates and to try to implement them and to integrate them in your, uh, in your experimental design. However, um, you are more and more able to also very freely decide how you uh, place your optodes. Um, also, for example, based on anatomical locations, on Broadman areas or other types of um, anatomical landmarks. And here I would like to point you to the FNIRS Optodes Location Decider or Fold Toolbox, which is a great tool for determining um, how you can place a free template on uh, on uh, your um, your caps, and um, this is also has also been covered already in another FNIRS um, hyperscanning or FNIRS web webinar provided by NRX. So uh, you can go to the webinar website and check this out. That's going to be really really useful. Of course, when you do this, you have to make sure that you can either reproduce whatever the fold uh, toolbox spits out on a pre-punched cap or whether you actually have to then punch these, the optode holder holes by yourselves or whether you ask, for example, our uh, NRX to punch these uh, holes for you. Um, and there you have to be, of course, very careful to um, always have these three centimeter distances because otherwise um, your signal quality might be um, impaired. And finally, this brings me to, to cap size for templates, optode arrays for spatial resolution. So you also need to consider that smaller caps, of course, they have fewer uh, slits or holes to, play, uh, to place um, optodes. You have to also consider that um, there might be different distances uh, between optodes. Um, so um, what I all, we always recommend is that you buy um, different sizes of caps and that you measure the had some uh, circumference of your participants before you put the hat so that also the cap is as tight as possible, um, still being comfortable, so you don't have lots of movement artifacts. But this is every always something that you need to take into consideration before you even um, start data acquisition or while you prepare your participants for, for data acquisition. All right. We talked about this a little bit last time, but I think we can go a little bit more into detail today. So. We were already considering um, baselines or control conditions. And I think this is an important question, especially for people who come from uh, EG or MEG. Um, so when we look, think about FNIUS hyperscanning experiments, uh, what do you think is a good baseline condition or what is a good control condition and what could actually be the differences between uh, a baseline and the control condition? And how useful do you think these two are uh, when you think then of data analysis, specifically of um, FNIRS hyperscanning, uh, yeah, data that you acquire in the lab. I'll let you think a little bit about this for some moments. So yeah, we th talked about this last time. So um, one control condition could be run random pairing. Uh, for EEG, uh, yes, the control, the baseline is at the beginning of each trial. Yes, we also mentioned it last time. Very good. So if you do a problem-solving task in a cooperation condition, then the a baseline would be a problem-solving one. Even though we should probably not call it baseline, but we should uh, we should call it an active control condition, right? Uh, yes, the control condition depends on the main condition. Uh, Yes, we can have do nothing. We can also have uh, active control. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm not sure, but you could maybe use my talk as a baseline. Um, yeah, so you should make, you should, well, we have to, we have to see, right? Because if we are measuring synchrony, we want to have it from the same brain area, right? Yes, so there should there should be a crucial difference. We could do some localizers, yes. Uh, resting state, 
yeah, so we, we have quite a few considerations here. Thank you so much for that. Now, uh, let's see what I wanted to actually uh, show you um, about this baseline control condition consideration. So I think we have to um, we have three three distinctions that we have to make here. We could have a baseline, which is more um, coming from EG research, where we actually, before each event, take about one seconds or two seconds, which serve our, as our baseline, and we then usually subtract the the uh, event related signal from that baseline. That's not something that we usually do for FNIRS research. Also, not something we usually do for fMRI, both of which uh, are um, related to the bold uh, signal, right? Then we could have a baseline measurement, basically where we have um, activity not related to the task that we actually want to analyze, which then represents brain activity during a resting state, right? Which has um, apparently minimal changes in cerebral, uh, cerebral blood flow. But we saw the last time that a resting condition is not always that nice because it, it in, induces quite a lot of variance in the signal. And um, so it might actually prevent us from finding differences between the active control condition and the resting condition. What we usually want to do in, Hef in FNIRS hyperscanning, especially if we analyze it in, in blocks, right, where we have, for example, a cooperation block and an individual block, we want to have a good control measurement that is related to some aspects of our uh, active task, but um, that has one or two crucial differences that separate it from uh, the active task that we have. And um, so when we plan our study, we want to have uh, not necessarily a baseline measurement. We don't subtract activity from each trial from a baseline pre-trial period. What we really want to do is a, have a good control measurement. For example, as I said, an individual condition when we want to look as a cooperation condition as our active condition. So here we have to be a little bit careful about terminology and we have to see where we come, where, where we are coming from because some people as I said, coming from EEG or MEG research are more prone to using these kind of baseline concepts or, or um, methods, uh, but this is not really uh, that um, necessary because in FNIRS hyperscanning, we usually go with blocks and we don't have event-related designs and we really want to have a good active uh, control condition. So it's worth to re reiterate this, even though we have already spoken about it uh, last time. Now, the next thing that is really crucial for uh, FNIRS hyperscanning is signal quality. And of course, this is also very important for FNIRS measurement in single participants. But for FNIRS hyperscanning, it is even more uh, important because if we are measuring from the same brain areas in two participants and the signal is bad in one participant, then we automatically lose the same region, the same optode, the same channel from the other participant because then we cannot derive any synchrony or any coherence measure. And so to have a, a good um, chance for deriving high quality synchrony or coherence, we need to make sure that the single person data is as good as possible. And there are many basic things that we need to, um, to do, right? So we should remove uh, the hair, for example, with a Q-tape. Um, we should make sure that the cables are not tangled up. We should always have a consistent lighting uh, conditions. So for example, the lights should be down, or if we want to measure in very strong ambient light that we um, consider an overcap that is put over the uh, the optodes. Uh, we, should cons uh, we might consider short channels, uh, which I will talk about a little bit later. And we should make sure that we uh, spend enough time on the calibration, but not too much time because of course, um, Sometimes, especially if we work together with families with children, the longer the calibration takes, the more restless the children become, and then the worse the data quality might be later on. Now, again, on the NRX website, there is a very nice NRX signal quality guide where you can actually look at different sources of error when you use the software inbuilt tool to see whether the uh, the raw data quality between two channels is actually good or not so good. And there have, are these very nice visual 
outputs that show you which channels are better and which channels are not so good. And then, you know, there are many different steps you can go through um, that are related, for example, to the uh, to the cap, you know, that there is hair or that uh, the probes are incorrectly placed, the distance between the optodes is too long, there's too much light, and so on and so forth. There is also some considerations of um, the optodes and some quite um, general considerations of what you can do for um, troubleshooting if you see in your software inbuilt uh, display that the signal is actually not that bad, uh, not that good or quite bad. And there is actually also a very nice video that is provided on um, the NR NRX website that really shows you where this um, signal quality display is coming from and um, what you can do to increase your data quality before you show before you um, um, start your actual data measurement. So here I would like to really point you to the very nice um, resources that are already available on the NRX website. But maybe you don't just want to look at, you know, these um, indications of excellent, acceptable, critical, or too low um, signal levels, but you want to actually look at um, more detailed properties of the raw signal. And for this, I have another little um, interactive quality for you. So imagine that you're setting up your your study that you want to make sure that your uh, data is good enough before you start the recording and you want to look at the raw data. And so a question for you, what do you think or how do you think does good or bad FNIRS raw data actually look like? What are the things that you should be looking out for when you are um, having your participants in the lab and you want to do a raw signal data quality check? So what should you be looking for? What should be in the data and what should rather not be in the data? Uh, yes, so some uh, good, some calm wave. You see the heartbeat. Uh, seeing a heart rate, yes. So that's one thing. I also think that, um, think of the fact that you have um, oxygenated uh, data, but you also have deoxygenated data. So you can look at both of these. Uh, yes, so that's um, heartbeat, no big spikes. You should see asynchronicity between deoxy and oxy. Shouldn't be too noisy. Should have uh, a clear wave-like appearance. Yeah, of course, it would be really good if we had more um, high quality analysis of of good data, but maybe something that you can actually do in the lab with the resources that are available to you when you start uh, your analysis, right? So thank you very much for that. Uh, so again, I took this information, sorry, from um, the NRX website. So these are some indications uh, for uh, better signal quality and, and not so good signal quality. So for uh, in the raw signal um, that you see in, um, in, in the software. So for good signal, you should see a clear heartbeat in the uh, oxy hemoglobin with about uh, 0 0.5 to 1 hertz frequency, right? Uh, depending on the age of your participants. And you sh should see little or no heartbeat signal in the deoxyhemoglobin. So this is shown here on, on the, the left on the top. The bad signal is uh, characterized by rather rapid and inconsistent variation in oxy and deoxyhemoglobin and not really representing heartbeat. And you see uh, sometimes also equal uh, amplitude um, in opposite direction if you have um, rather bad signal in your um, in your data. So if you have anything like here shown on the left on the bottom, then it's always um, good to recheck your optodes, recheck, um, maybe check whether there is some hair or stuck or whether there's something else and uh, not really um, perfect uh, to increase the signal um, quality to have better um, chances for a good synchrony um, later on when you analyze your data. Of course, you should also look for uh, artifacts, right? 
So you should probably have um, your participants move a little bit uh, around, move the head, not too much, but to move a little bit, because sometimes you can see some spikes uh, deep, uh, just because the cap is not um, placed properly on the head because it's not tight enough. Um, you should also look for some physiological noise, uh, slow drifts, right? Um, of course, we can deal with these things, and I will talk about this just in a second, but it's always better if they if they are not present in the data from the beginning. So um, it's always worth to take a little bit of time while you set participants up to not only look at those generic outputs of, of excellent, good, not so good, and really bad, but actually to look into the individual time courses of each channel to see whether you have um, these kind of indications for good or bad data and whether you actually have some motion artifacts or not. Right. So um, this brings me to the second part of today's webinar, namely what you actually do once you have acquired the data um, and therefore to data pre-processing. And here together with um, uh, Chin, uh, who was a um, first master student and PhD student and now a postdoc, and uh, Stefanie Höhl, who was um, Chin's uh, PhD supervisor, we developed a guide to parent-child FNUS hyperscanning data processing and analysis. Uh, you can see here on the right the, all the different steps that are part of this pre-processing. And this is um, published open access. And what it also includes is um, a OSF directory where you actually have um, free data from 20 parent-child dyads that uh, is uh, raw data, but also includes already processed data. And you also have <clears throat> all the necessary MATLAB scripts, starting uh, by converting uh, the NRX data to SBM data um, to extract the, um, the, the triggers um, to uh, do the um, pre-processing, the motion correction, the artifact correction, um, so you basically have scripts for each individual step that you can go through, that you can also understand what is actually happening there. And you then finally also have uh, scripts on how to plot these things and how to use, in this specific case, R to actually then really get at the comparison of the cooperation condition and the individual condition on the um, WTC data that you get at the end. So I. Uh, yeah, I would recommend that you have a look here, that you try this out. Uh, but of course, this is only one way of pre-processing the data. It doesn't mean that it, it's the only way and procedures are constantly changing, right? So it's um, it's also completely okay if you only use part of this or if you use something, uh, another pipeline. So just uh, a tool here for you to actually have a look and see what can be done, what is done, what has been done, and how it is done, right? Uh, for pre-processing, there are many different tools that are available in Homer 2 MATLAB, SPM for FNIRS in MATLAB, Brain Analyzer in MATLAB, other types of pipelines. And these days, all the manufacturers also have their own pre-processing software packages that you can use. But the basic steps that you should always do when you do data pre-processing is, um, is some automatic or manual check of the data. You need to convert uh, your raw data to optical density. You have to do some motion artifact correction. You usually do some bandpass filtering, and then you convert the changes um, into uh, uh, oxy and, and deoxy um, um, time courses. And with those, you then actually do the analysis. And as I said before, I cannot really go into details uh, in all the details today during the webinar, but just to make you aware of certain things and to point you to the right direction if you need additional resources. So let's start with um, data quality check. And I think that these days there uh, are two ways of looking at your data. One way that we recommend, but that of, uh, is a little bit more time consuming and is not ideal if you have a lot of data that you want to analyze at the same time is a visual data quality check. So we recommend that for each participant, for each channel, you derive a WTC plot and you just look at the it's a spectrum for each channel. And here on the left, you have four channels where data quality was quite good. And on the right, you have four channels where data quality was actually rather bad. 
And the most important thing to look at is um, the heartbeat, which is here now around 0 0.5 hertz, because I believe that the, this data was from children. So you should see a clear, strong, and consistent heart band uh, throughout the whole um, measurement period that you um, used. You should also not have too strong spikes, especially if you do this after the motion correction. You can do it before, but you can also do it after. Here on the right, you have uh, examples of bad data, right? That they, either there is no heart band, like here in channel four and channel eight, that something went quite uh, completely wrong with the data acquisition. If you see these funny plots, or that here for channel 15, you have a heart band, but you have quite strong uh, motion artifacts um, going uh, or, or spikes going into the heart band. So at some times it actually disappears. Now, as I have said before, this is not so useful if you have to analyze a lot of data at the same time. Um, but we, of course, always strongly recommend, recommend actually that after each acquisition, you check the data right away. Because if you acquire 50 participants and only then do the check, you might actually have to throw out quite a lot of data, especially if you have problems, for example, with the equipment so that certain channels are all of a sudden stop uh, uh, recording good data, right? So always look at your data right away. If you want to do this more objectively and more rapidly, then we recommend to do this with a automatic uh, prune function. So the EN prune channel function, which is taken from Homer 2, which automatically li labels bad channels by looking at uh, the expected uh, raw data range the signal to noise, ra noise ratio threshold or the interopto distance threshold. You can uh, um, adjust all of these values and then also see what it does to your data, how much it throws out, how, uh, how much it actually retains. And there is a very good uh, video available on YouTube um, made by Jonathan Perry on this, where he explains in detail um, what these, um, uh, yeah, what these, um, raw data ranges, signal to noise uh, threshold and interopto distance thresholds actually do and how you implement this directly in uh, Homer 2 uh, online. So if you want more insights into this, please go and check out this video. It's really, really helpful. The next thing you should be doing is to do some motion correction, some artifact correction. And there again, there are many different methods with which you can do this. Um, there are different um, people with different preferences. So you can lose for use, for example, spline interpolation, principal component analyses, wavelet thresholding, temporal derivative uh, distribution repair. And all of these have certain advantages, certain pitfalls. So what we usually use and what we also describe in our guide is uh, spline interpolation. And so here you see what this actually does. So here you see the raw signal uh, in panel A with a strong spike in about the middle, around 40 seconds. And what uh, this method does actually that it calculates a moving standard deviation. And then if you do that, you see that around 40 seconds, you have a very strong spike in the standard deviation that clearly goes above the threshold that uh, we have set. And so what then the uh, algorithm does is that it um, isolates this period where there is uh, this strong spike and that it then interpolates uh, a time window from before and after this spike and then corrects finally the signal um, by removing um, this spike and also um, adjusting here, for example, in this strong baseline shift that actually follows this spike. And we have found that this uh, works pretty well. Um, but again, this is just one method of doing things. And if you are more comfortable or more experienced with uh, using other tools, then please go ahead and do it with those other tools. And here is just an example from our guide. So on the top, you have the oxy and deoxy signal before this correction. And on the bottom, you have this uh, oxy and deoxy signal after this correction. Um, just for you to see what this actually does. But you can, when you use our sample data, also look at these things by yourselves and see what actually happens with these parameters if you use uh, different thresholds and different other kinds of things. Um, what you should also then do is to look um, at uh, bandpass filtering. So usually what is done is that um, people um, remove uh, quite a bit of the, especially the, the higher frequencies, because 
in those higher frequencies, we are more likely to have uh, cardiac uh, heart rate artifacts. We have a uh, higher likelihood there to have um, respiration artifacts or some muscle artifacts, you know, also related to um, Meyer waves. And then uh, we also need to take into consideration that we have, uh, we might have some very low frequency artifacts, which um, we might also uh, want to filter out. Of course, what you also need to consider is your task frequency, right? So if your task frequency, for example, is in this window here, which we usually uh, use, then you are not that likely to have uh, cardiac and respiration um, artifacts, and um, but you are more likely to have these um, uh, myogenic artifacts. And what also is really interesting here in this um, publication is that they show differences between artifacts captured with um, standard long channel um, distances and with the short channel distances. And as you can see, uh, you are less likely to have a very low frequency artifacts captured with the short channels, but you are quite likely to have the short, uh, the cardiac respiration and myogenic artifacts to be actually captured by the short channels. And so for these kind of artifacts, a short, adding a short channel might actually be of advantage. And this brings me exactly to the next topic, which is short channels, right? So uh, these days, um, short channels are quite standard in, in your, uh, even in your bundles that you acquire. Um, and the short channels basically uh, are usually 10 uh, millimeters long. And so they are not penetrating too um, strongly into um, actually the brain, but they stay in, um, in the extracerebral and the cerebral um, um, space, right? And so um, the advantage here is that um, when you measure the short channels, you might only get uh, some of the artifacts, but you, you might actually not really measure um, the data that you are then analyzing in terms of interpersonal neural synchrony. And then by regressing out, for example, the short channel signal, you might be able to clean up your signal from the normal, from the long range channel. However, what you need to take into consideration here is that um, it might not be enough to just use a simple regression by only removing, um, you know, the raw uh, short um, optode signal, because there are quite a few uh, publications from experts in the field who are saying that the short channel regression in functional uh, NIRS is uh, more effective when you actually include a few other additional um, parameters like um, uh, global PCA regressors, phase shifted um, signals. Uh, so um, when you really want to use short channels and to use them for cleaning your data, for removing motion artifacts, uh, please consider uh, such kind of literature in, in, in detail because um, there is a slight risk that when you do this improperly that you are actually increasing the, the artifacts and you are um, um, making your data slightly worse. So it's always good to consider this, but it needs to be done properly. So it's not, it's not a quick fix. It should really be done uh, with, with uh, due care and diligence. And finally, you then just do the HBO to HBR conversion. And here is another example from the guide uh, how the final data in our case then uh, looked like. Uh, one more thing regarding the HBO and HBR data. So um, there is quite a discussion in the field whether um, synchrony should always be derived only um, on the HBO data or whether it should also be derived on the HBR data. And as you can see from this publication, that is actually a review that looked at many different papers uh, reporting these kinds of findings. They um, are quite consistently reporting that in about 50% of the cases, um, the HBO data was reported only and that um, in about 40%, 45% of cases, both the HBO and the HBR data is actually being uh, reported. Um, but in most of the cases, the um, coherence analysis is then only done on the HBO data. Um, and um, yeah, the justification of only reporting HBO data is quite often uh, linked to the fact um, or is actually, sorry, is actually not provided. Um, 
often it is then said that you know the the HBO data is more sensitive to task evoke changes, and that uh, so in some cases there was no significant findings for the HBR data. And um, so we what we would um, suggest is that you at least also report the HBR data and maybe reproduce your analysis with the HBR data. Um, but uh, it's probably okay if you um, only um, base your main um, um, analysis on the HBO data, because that is what is quite consistently uh, most um, uh, often done, and where also uh, usually the more you're more likely to find some effects, especially if you use wavelet transform coherence, as we have discussed uh, last time. All right. Now I'm running out of time a little bit, but maybe I can still have a couple minutes to talk about a few considerations of data analysis. So we already talked about the task frequency and the frequency of interest, and that you should really carefully choose the task frequency beforehand. Um, now, of course, you can also take your data, uh, ideally some pilot data, and do some decomposition of your um, of your um, uh, frequencies and see where for your specific task that you are using, you see the highest coherence values. And these coherence values, they might quite strongly differ, for example, for the resting state or for a free play or for some predictive uh, tasks, right? But again, to reiterate what I have already said last time, what you should not be doing is to check for different frequencies in your main analysis and then only report those uh, frequencies where you actually find the highest coherence value because that wouldn't be a proper science, right? You can always do this exploratively or you can, of course, um, derive different analysis for different frequency bands, but then you should um, correct for multiple comparison in the sense that you correct for the number of frequency bands that you look at. And so here, if you want to uh, be more, more cautious, um, it's probably better to average over a larger frequency um, um, window, especially if you have tasks where you are more, in, uh, where your participants are engaged in, in free play, in not so structured interactions where it's really difficult to predict where your task frequency will actually be. Um, also, just a few considerations on um, what kind of measure you are actually uh, using to derive your um, synchrony values, right? We have already seen last time that for FNIRS hyperscaling data, coherence, also the wavelet transform coherence, WTC, is used most consistently and um, uh, is used most often. But there is also quite um, a bit of studies that use uh, correlation. And uh, none of these method is, um, is, is you know, better or worse or wrong or right, but you have to consider certain things, especially when you use um, correlations, because we have seen that for uh, wavelet transform coherence, which is here depicted on the bottom, that you have quite strong and consistent um, WTC synchrony, uh, regardless of the frequency of this, uh, the, the, the phase um, of the two signals that you are deriving the frequency from, right? So for wavelet transform coherence, um, your synchrony is high for in-phase, for phase shifts, but even for anti-phase. When you use um, simple correlations, uh, this is also true, but you can see that you have a, a shift in, in um, from a strongest correlation value of one to a strongest correlation value of minus one, and that if you have a certain um, shift in the signal, uh, specifically of, of two seconds, then you will actually have a maximum um, coherence value of zero. So you have to really be careful in um, quantifying which is actually the strongest uh, coherence value that you can get, um, because this will be different depending on the phase relationships of your signals. This is not the case when you have WTC because here the strongest uh, uh, synchrony value that you can get is always one. And so you just have to be very careful of this when you then actually um, look at your data and when you, you make some interpretations depending on the strength of your synchrony quantified by the correlation value, which is um, between one and uh, zero and one, or even between uh, zero and minus one for the correlation specifically. 
And uh, finally, uh, what we have already touched upon uh, last time, if you have um, paradigms that are really difficult to find a good um, control condition for, an active control condition for, then what we are recommending <clears throat> is that you do a control analysis in terms of a random permutation. And this is a preprint here that um, is uh, freely available on, on, on the OSF page where we did this for a study that had uh, 140 real uh, parent-child dyads. And so for each of those dyads, we calculated the maximum number of random pairs, right? So if we have one mother and one child, um, we can then take this mother and we can pair this mother randomly with the 139 remaining um, children from the other dyads and therefore um, calculate 139 permutations and then average these values and then compare those permutation uh, values with uh, the real values from the experiment. And as you can see here, we then did this and we for each of our three conditions, so cooperation, independent and resting, we found a significant difference between the real, the synchrony from the real dyads versus the synchrony derived from the random dyads. And this for us then is another really strong indication um, uh, that um, something unique was happening in our in our conditions in our dyads that goes beyond some spurious correlation that could just be introduced by having two people do something really similar um, at the same time but not uh, not together. And if you want to do this permutation analysis, you can also go to our analysis guide in which we have um, not only the scripts to do that but also uh, uh, further explanations. Right, so I hope that uh, these more practical considerations regarding data collection, data pre-processing, and data analysis were uh, useful. As Mahipal has already said, more details um, are available on uh, the website, um, where uh, also you find much um, many links to additional resources to most of the papers and the publications I have shown you today quite briefly, where you can follow up on that and uh, go into this in more detail. Uh, and I'm happy to take a few questions now, and I'm sure that if you need additional support, the NRX team will also be very happy to assist you further. So thank you a lot. Thanks a lot again for having me for your um, invitation, for your attention, and I'll stick around a little bit for longer if you have a few questions right now. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We have a couple of questions in the chat, and we also received a few more uh, during the registration process. So I'll start with the with the chat one because that seems more relevant. Would you apply the same pre-processing pipeline to children and adult data? Uh, yes, if you can maybe just unshare me again, that would be nice so I can see some faces. Uh, I don't seem to see this uh, up here. And um, so, uh, yeah, I can already start talking, right? So, ah, sorry, here it is, stupid. Um, yes, so we are applying mostly the same pre-processing pipeline for data from adults and from children. There are a few details that uh, need to be considered. Or one, of course, is if you have a different interoptal distance. And the other one is the distal path length factor that um, we slightly adjust. But otherwise, um, I don't think that we are uh, using very different pre-processing steps. Um, but we, of course, need to consider that our the children that participate in our studies are like four, five, six years old, and they are not infants. So if you have uh, infant data, you need to do um, different pre-processing. But I think this was covered in a previous uh, webinar that's also recorded uh, that can be seen on the website. And for this, I'm not really an expert, so I don't want to say anything wrong there. But so for our studies where we have older children, most of the pre-processing steps are similar. All right. OK, uh, how do you account for siblings slash twins in permutation analysis? That's a very good question. Uh, we didn't have that so far. 
Uh, so we um, we always had children, and uh, so we only had one child per family. Um, the question there, of course, also would be whether the siblings or the twins they play they interact with the mother the same mother two times or whether they interact with a different adult right so we have to also probably take that into consideration um so i would i would probably not pair the same parent with um two times with a different sibling because there might be some overlap in these in these interactions um, but yeah, that's a really good question. I would probably need a little bit more time because we have never had that case before. So, um, I'm put a little bit on the spot now here. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so, um, we would probably have to think about this. Yes. So it's, yeah, I'll leave it there for now. <laughs> Hopefully that's fine enough, good enough. It's a good excuse to get in touch with you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, so there's one, I hope I understand it properly. Um, if you have any resources on how to do this decomposition for pilot data, that would be helpful. Uh, so and it's a time frequency decomposition, right? Sorry, yeah. Oh yeah. I so, lost um, a bit track when the question yes. came. Um... I, could, I could possibly get hold of that because that's not something that we, um... We, we did because we pre-specified our task frequency between 10 and 50 uh, period seconds. And then we, uh, we we stuck to that. But of course, yeah, that's, this can be quite uh, quickly done uh, on, on any types of data, also on, on the pilot data, um, for example, in MATLAB or, or, or other programs. And yeah, sure. So um, uh, I could probably add, add this on the website, or maybe I could also do this um, personally if people want to contact me. All right, sounds good. Um, so this question was from Ellen, and if I have misunderstood or misread it, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask it. Um, okay, all right, I got it. Um, then there were a few questions during registration. Um, first one is what kind of phase lock index in bracket, if any, is most commonly used as a proxy for neural synchronization and why? Yes. Um, so to make this short and relevant, this is usually not something that we are doing for FNIRS uh, hyperscaling, especially if you are using WTC, because there we allow different phase uh, relationships to count. Um, or, or basically, as I have shown this time and, and last week, um, any type of phase relationship between two, two signals is going to be linked with higher synchrony as long as it's consistent, right? This is more usually something done for, for uh, EG data. Uh, so uh, re, um, yeah, so if if this um, person doesn't want to do EG hyperscanning, then for, for right now, this is not really relevant because um, it's not usually looked at for FNIRS hyperscanning data, especially WTC. All right. On this question, I will still read it. Are there any data pre-processing steps that are straightforward enough that an undergrad RA could help with them? Uh, yes, absolutely. So we, when we developed our pipeline and used the pipeline, we had uh, quite a few undergraduates, uh, yeah, graduates, uh, students in the lab um, uh, actually working on the data day to day. What uh, I personally think is really nice about um, the, the guide and then also these different um, uh, code snippets is that each pre-processing step is its own script. So you can, uh, you and each uh, pre-processing um, step is annotated. So you, you, you see exactly, okay, this parameter stands for that, this function does this. So you can step-by-step step go through all of these um, processes because sometimes if you have a final script that just does pre-processing, you don't really know what's happening, right? So if you use those scripts to familiarize yourself with the different steps, then it's it's certainly something that um, undergraduate students can do. Of course, it helps if um, 
students have a little bit of experience in using coding or, or MATLAB more specifically. But uh, since it is really a cut into these different pieces and you can look at the signal before and after and you it's really nicely annotated, uh, you can also yeah, quite easily see what actually is happening and why it's happening and it's easier to learn than just using a pre-made pipeline that just does everything from A to Z without explanation. All right, makes sense. This is more general. Um, how do we make sure that our experiments are reproducible? Yes, this is a very important question. So um, for FNIRs and especially hyperscanning, we don't have any procedures yet that every lab agrees upon that this is the gold standard and this should be done. You know, for EG and for fMRI, we have our programs, you know, with, let's say SPM or other programs, and there are very standard procedures, for example, for fMRI data pre-processing, what you are actually doing. Um, there are different labs working on uh, on this, so we are not the only one uh, who have proposed such a guide. There are other labs um, who have um, made different guidelines. What I think is really important is that in your publications, you report as many details as possible uh, about, for example, the pre-processing you know, which uh, which kind of uh, thresholds did you use? Uh, what kind of uh, motion artifact correction um, uh, method did you use? Um, so that people can um, compare those to the, the methods they are using. Ideally, you can put the data online so that people can reproduce what you have done and hopefully find the same thing. Or if not, that they can actually spot some mistakes, which will, of course will be at the first moment, um, a bit disheartening, but in the long run, of course, better for science. So, um, yeah, being uh, being open, trying to put as many things as possible online for other people to access, to work with, and to be very rigorous in the way you are reporting what you actually did and how you did it. All right. One more question on filtering. Is there any reason to use bandpass filter before time frequency decomposition? Wavelet uh, decomposition should help, but also distort like every pre-processing information in the signal. If you only select some low frequency in the WTC, there is no evidence that filtering before recommended. Yes, let me quickly have a look at... Um where we have this actually in our pipeline before i say anything wrong here we are so we in our pipeline we say so we do the automatic pruning we do the conversion we do the motion correction and then we do the filtering uh, yes. So I would say this has, um, I mean, it depends also a little bit where you have your um, um, task frequency, right? Because the, the filtering is usually uh, removing high frequency data or low frequency data. And if, if, if your task frequency is in somewhere in between anyways, then it shouldn't have uh, too strong of an effect. But um, yeah, here I can only say what we have in the guideline where we actually do the the filtering on the motion corrected uh, motion corrected data before we do the WTC. But um, I'm happy to take this discussion further if 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 more clarification is needed. Okay. Then bit of a jump, but are there uh, are there specific considerations on the impact of large blood vessels? on interpersonal synchrony. So the vessel in the bracket is superior sagittal sinus. Oh, that's a, that's a really interesting question, but I have to say that um, yeah, this is something that I 
can't really speak to right at the moment. But again, if um, if we want to take this further, I'd be very, uh, very happy and open to discuss this. But um, I would assume that there are some constraints, of course, um, for where you measure, right? So with, with fMRI, there, there is, it's known that there is a problem with the orbital frontal cortex where there is a, lot, a large cavity. So there's a lot of air as well. And of course that um, the bolt signal depends on blood. And if you have a large blood vessel in the vicinity that probably you will have uh, different readings of, of, of blood flow and, and absorption. So I, I think that this plays a role, but um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't feel comfortable going into too many uh, details right at the moment. Yeah, sorry for that. All right. Then there are two more that just popped up. Pretend one wants to look at heart rate synchronization during the task. They band pass the signal around the heart rate and run WTC on those data. Is this a good idea or not really? Um, I would probably, I would probably, um, recommend against it and rather um, say that it's much better to have actually an, a, a high quality heart rate measurement using other recording devices. Um, and also if I say other recording devices and not just a, you know, a small infrared uh, monitor on the tip of the finger, for example, that can be used, but really some uh, more uh, high end um, heart rate ECG measurement that you actually put uh, electrodes uh, on the on the chest to really have um, high quality, um, high resolution um, data rather than the data that is um, available from the WTC data in the FNIRS hyperscanning uh, frequency band. Okay. I think that's that's mostly it for the questions. If you have missed anything, something comes to your mind later, please write to us and uh, yeah, we'll confirm with Pascal and get you those answers. That's it everyone. Thank you very much for joining and thanks once again, Dr. Vitika for this amazing series of webinars. I think all of us learned quite a bit. And hopefully yeah, became lot. better FNIRS hyperscanners. Yeah, and good luck, to, uh, good luck to everybody using FNIRS hyperscanning with their studies. It's a very exciting time. We are still learning lots of new things every day. Uh, but of course, we have to make sure that what we are doing is, um, is uh, to the highest quality possible and that it's actually uh, reproducible. So um, yeah. Good luck with all of your uh, with your studies, and uh, it will be really nice to to be reading all of uh, about all of them in the in the coming years. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you.